last MCU movie of the year has dropped in theaters. Over the last several months, I've read two different gigantic books on the history of Marvel Studios. I've watched a ton of interviews with the actors and I've written one zillion new notes. So it's time to stop and rank all 45 MCU movies and TV shows from the worst to the best. In last place, She-Hulk. From beginning to end, the MCU's biggest misfire. Feige has always wanted to make movies that took the source material seriously, but not themselves. It's the balance, right, between poking fun at it, or taking yes. the piss out of a moment, but also taking it seriously. She-Hulk gets the formula all wrong. Instead of poking fun at the silliness of the fiction, it goes after the reality of the MCU. So the movie trolls its own fans. It goes to world destroying levels of fourth wall breaking. Hello, Jennifer. Kevin. And it has insane levels of silliness. He almost tasted that. Num, 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 eat it up. Are you kidding me? But at the same time, it took itself very serious. So you have She-Hulk lecturing Hulk on the grievances of women. And one of the head writers said she wanted to make a sex positive show for children. I get wanting to expand the brand, but not like this. 44, Thor, Love, and Thunder, where Ragnarok pushed the boundary of how wacky you can go with the MCU, Thor, Love, and Thunder seems to think it's not possible to go too far. So we're left with a mess of a film. This level of Waititi silliness and irreverence simply doesn't mesh with a story about cancer, child death, child abduction, and which tackles the theological problem of evil, so the audience is left with tonal whiplash. It's time for another good idea, bad idea. Good idea. Casting world-class actor Christian Bale as your movie's villain. Bad idea. Putting world-class actor Christian Bale playing a dark villain in the goofiest movie in your franchise. Here I am. It's disheartening because it's an utter waste of an incredibly talented cast, a compelling villain, and emotionally resonant themes. Waititi's made movies that I really like. This one, a stinker. Sometimes people drop stinkers. Next up, Thor The Dark World, an early victim of the Marvel Studios machine. Initially, Patty Jenkins was supposed to direct the film and she wanted to make it Romeo and Juliet in space and the writers wanted Hela as the villain. However, the Marvel Creative Committee, a group of businessmen in New York who had creative power over Kevin Feige, vetoed the idea because they didn't think an intergalactic romance and Hela would sell enough toys, so Jenkins left the project. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. And the released film is the most mediocre MCU film to date. I mean, it has all the jokes, movie stars, flashy effects, and in-focus shots that a movie is supposed to have, but it is utterly bland, and they replaced Hela with the most forgettable villain in the entire MCU, Malkith. How did those Malkith toy sales go for you? More recently, director Alan Taylor has said that the movie they released is not the movie that he shot. They completely changed the film with 35 days of reshoots and reworking the entire film in the editing room. And that's what it feels like, a movie without a distinct creative vision directed by committee. Mediocre. 42 Eternals. A respectable, ambitious, total misfire. This movie did not work for me. And I can appreciate that Chloe Zhao wanted to tell this big sweeping epic about these Eternals that have been amongst us throughout the decades that's celebrating humanity while also looking at the worst of our kind. However, trying to do all of that in a movie where you're introducing 10 different characters flashing back and forth throughout time, tackling all of these philosophical questions with complex motivations. It causes the movie to just crumble under its own weight. It's trying to check too many boxes with the plot, with the characters, with the ideas, and you can't do all of that with a movie where there's just so much work that needs to be done just simply laying the foundation. I will say this, this is the kind of risk that I appreciate the MCU taking. It didn't work for me, 
but at least I, I think this was worth trying. 41, Secret Invasion. In the year 2023, the most overused criticism is, it felt like it was written by AI. In the case of Secret Invasion, parts of it literally were created by AI. <laughs> to me, this show was a sign of just how dire the situation has gotten at Marvel Studios. I mean, it starts off well enough as this potentially interesting paranoia thriller with good character elements, then it goes absolutely nowhere in the middle, and by the end, it turns into this totally thoughtless slam bang finale where they literally give Amelia Clark God mode powers. They make her the most powerful character in the entire MCU and we don't even know her name and just kind of shuffle her off to be a spy. Worst ending ever. As if Kevin Feige didn't read the scripts, didn't see the reshoots, and didn't see the final product before they crapped this thing out on Disney+. Plus. It's been well documented that this show went through four months of reshoots, and it's not nearly long enough that that makes any sense. There were competing visions trying to decide what to do, and that's what this feels like, a show desperately trying to decide what it wants to be while everyone's trying to throw something different in there, and it does not work, and it really screws up the MCU if you stop and think about just how powerful Amelia Clark's character really is. You've made a huge mistake. Real quick, I wanna to thank today's sponsor, HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-proportioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. The holidays are right around the corner. My wife and I have spent the last several days scheduling so many different holiday events. And you can take the stress out of prepping dinner by having it delivered right to your front door. HelloFresh can make your holiday season even tastier. Choose from over 45 weekly recipes and over 100 curated picks from the HelloFresh market. My family is in a crazy busy season of life. We don't have time. HelloFresh solves that problem and makes home-cooked meals doable. And all five members of my family, including the three kids, ate everything and wanted more. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Sean Chandler free and use code Sean Chandler free for free breakfast for life. That's one free breakfast item per box while your subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash Sean Chandler free with code Sean Chandler free. And let's get back to Marvel. 40, Captain Marvel, the movie, like its lead character, struggles to know its place and identity. The movie both wants to be this wacky adventure with lots of jokes and 90s pop music, while also being this serious story about refugees trying to escape genocide. And with the way the story is structured, our lead character kills these refugees that we think at the beginning are the villains and turn up their victims at the end, and the movie never really pauses long enough for us to absorb the horrors of what's going on, so it comes off emotionally empty. Likewise, because our lead character has amnesia, she doesn't know who she is or what she stands for, thus she always kind of feels at arm's length. Is that like a personal attack or something? We never feel like we really get to know her other than maybe a couple scenes here and there, which once again makes the movie feel distant and emotionally empty. Sure, there's some fun superficially speaking to be had, but a movie with nothing below the surface. 39, Moon Knight. I desperately wanted to love this one, but the show itself seems to be struggling with multiple personalities, just like its lead character. You don't like it? It, it starts off with an intriguing mystery about this awkward guy, and then it kind of meanders in the middle with this globe-trotting adventure about Egyptian gods, a religious cult, this guy's love life, and then at the end of the season, we literally go to the Egyptian afterlife. Wow, that was weird. And the season closes out with a freaking episode of Power Rangers in front of the Great Pyramids. Go, go, Power Rangers! I just wanted a superhero show with Moon Knight, and I got a lot of stuff, but I didn't get a lot of Moon Knight. And you blow it!
You blew it. Next, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. What should have been a safe and easy early win for Disney Plus by taking two likable side characters, putting them front and center and showcasing their buddy antics. Instead, trips itself up with a villain that it never allows to be a villain by having the characters make baffling decisions where Bucky would rather work with Zemo than Walker? And then finally, it just has so much heavy-handed, on-the-nose lecturing. You've got to do better, Senator. You've got to step up. Rewatching it a month ago, I still enjoy the banter between Sam and Bucky. There's some action sequences that are pretty cool, but it just doesn't come together in the end. And I think some of that probably is because they reworked the story and cut some elements out due to COVID. 37, The Marvels, a movie of fun moments, largely due to Amon Villani, pulled together by a nonsensical plot and messy as can be storytelling. It's a bit like saying a car that doesn't run looks nice, because you put a fresh coat of paint on it. This feels like another victim of an overly crowded MCU and Kevin Feige being spread too thin to be able to properly develop the scripts. So we're left with a movie which feels like you have to do a bunch of homework to understand who two of the lead characters are. And since the original script wasn't properly massaged and developed in pre-production, you get a movie which feels like it's duct tape together by reshoots and where it feels like big chunks of the entire movie are just missing. This is a mess. None of these storylines make any sense. And even with what you have, it just has that generic MCU flavor, like it came through the assembly line and director Nia DaCosta, who has a distinctive style, even admitted, yeah, it's a Kevin Feige film, really. It's not really my film. And I think that says it all. 36, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantum Mania, the much anticipated debut of Kang proper, turned out to be one of the bigger disappointments in MCU history. Now, I'm not as antagonistic towards this movie as others, but it's not nearly as good as it should have been. Over the last few years, something called the Marvel Studios Parliament has had creative control over the projects. So in interviews, when actors refer to the they... And then I think they did want the opportunity to change some stuff, and so they just want that freedom. They are referring to the Marvel Studios Parliament. It's a group of producers that oversee the scripts, order rewrites, and order reshoots. Is they they do rework stuff. And the results of the parliament don't tend to be fantastic. The projects with heavy involvement from the parliament are rarely brilliant, and they tend to have that generic MCU feel where I say it feels like it was directed by committee. Well, it wasn't a committee, but it was a parliament. Vangeline Lilly even said the original script for this movie was fairly straightforward. Do you know what's strange? Yeah. Is the script reads much more straightforward than the film itself. When I saw the film, I was like, this is, like you said, this is bananas. Yeah. But after countless rewrites and reshoots all the way up until a month before the movie came out, the story just kind of got lost. It turned generic and wacky. There was no real stakes. They introduced the big antagonist for this saga, and he's defeated by Ant-Man and some ants, which is rather anticlimactic. What do we need the Avengers for if Ant-Man can do it with his friends? So this seems like a movie that's a perfect example of there just being too many cooks in the kitchen. Too many cooks, too many cooks. Point of reference right here is our fresh, rotten, thumbs up, thumbs down line. The ones we've talked about thus far, I'm going thumbs down. And the ones moving forward, we are going thumbs Thumbs up. 35, Iron Man 2. And I perceive of this as a growing pains movie for Marvel Studios. What I mean by that is that when Marvel Studios started, it was an independent film studio that took out a massive loan in order to fund the creation of the first four movies. When Iron Man was a hit, they thought, let's strike while the iron is hot. Let's put out Iron Man 2 in just two years, pay off our loan, and secure our financial future. Jon Favreau thought they needed three years in order to get the script right, develop it, and just 
to deliver the same quality as before, and Kevin Feige is in the process of trying to establish this cinematic universe and build towards the Avengers down the road. Which meant they had three different visions for what they were trying to do with this movie, and I think you feel that watching the film. Part of the magic of the first Iron Man is that there was a certain camaraderie improv in what they were doing on that set, which didn't work on the second film when they had a shorter production ramp up, as well as Favreau already being exhausted, and there were more locked points in the story and the script to set up other things. So you end up with this movie that doesn't have very many action sequences. It's very disjointed with all of these different plots going on. And it just doesn't really excite the way the first film did. Now, I think the cast is still fun. There's moments that are funny. The action set pieces are just as thrilling as the first film, but the product overall feels like there's too many cooks in the kitchen. Too many cooks, too many cooks. Trying to rush something out, and so it just doesn't work like it did before. Next up, Spider-Man Far From Home. This is a superficially entertaining film where individual scenes might be funny, exciting, have cool visuals, but the story tying them together doesn't make any sense. This movie, to me, feels like the start of where the cracks start to show in the MCU as a whole and where perhaps Kevin Feige was being spread too thin and couldn't give individual scripts and films the oversight that he needed. So things started to get through that just didn't make any sense. I mean, the basic plot of this movie is that Tony Stark left his dangerous military grade glasses to a high schooler who had been dead for five years with no instructions. That's a weird story. It doesn't make any sense. Once again, the villain is motivated for scorn for Tony Stark, even though Tony Stark is dead. Me, baby, one more time. And there's a sequence in the movie where a grown woman tells an underage child to undress in front of her while she's watching. To take off your clothes. Okay. And the movie doesn't seem to know that's bad. No, don't like that. I get that it's fun if you enjoy it, fair enough, but you need a story that holds water pulling it all together. 33, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 2. Now, historically, I've had this movie very close to the bottom of my MCU rankings, and that has been one of the hottest takes I have had on my channel. But after Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 and in the context of phases four and five, I have a kind of a newfound appreciation for this film, where so many projects over the last couple of years have felt like they were directed by committee or reworked and reshot. There's no distinctive style. They're just generic MCU product. In that context, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 feels like a movie that has a soul, that James Gunn cared about these characters and he was trying to communicate something specific in his style. Granted, I still think the movie has serious structural issues. I don't like the way the villain is handled and that it's a villain reveal in the third act. I think there's an unnecessary mean streak to the film. <laughs> I'm hideous? You are horrifying to look at, yes. But I think it does play better after seeing Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, and as I said before, it feels like an actual movie directed by a director and writer with a singular voice. 32, The Incredible Hulk. I find this to be possibly the most underrated or misunderstood film in the MCU. Obviously, I don't think it's top tier. It's nowhere near my top tier. But when people are like, I hate it, it's garbage. I, I don't really understand where they're coming from. And I feel it's a movie that a lot of people judge it poorly simply because it feels so different from the rest of the MCU. It's also a movie that I think a certain amount of Respect and enjoyment can come for this film if you watched the old Bill Bixby, Lou Ferrigno, Incredible Hulk TV series. There's a lot of that show built into this movie. I think the Hulk action is good. And so there's a bunch here that I really respect. 
it also does have its issues. This is a very rare example of an MCU film where the movie star carried a lot of storytelling power. In fact, Edward Norton had in his contract that he would get to do a pass on the script. And so there was all sorts of behind the scenes trouble of his vision for the film, the director's vision for the film, the producer's vision for the film. And you feel that when you see the final product, it's not entirely ironed out in the product that was released. And thus also, Edward Norton was not asked to return. But I think a lot of people don't give this one the credits due, though it's not entirely a smash. 31 Thor. Now this is an enjoyable movie, but also one where you can feel the growing pains. An early challenge of the MCU was trying to figure out how do you tell these grounded, human-based stories like Iron Man, and also have cosmic space gods. Gotta figure that out, bridge that gap. And this is the first movie that was really doing that. And you can feel the pieces don't quite fit just yet. They brought in Kenneth Branagh because of his long history directing Shakespearean films and this movie thematically as well as aesthetically. You can kind of feel how Shakespeare would help the Asgardian aspects of the film, but you also do have a pretty harsh shift when you go to Earth and it turns into a fish out of water comedy. What? The juxtaposition is intentional, but you do feel it as well. But it's also a movie where trying to tell this story about fathers, sons, brothers, cosmic fish out of water, Shakespearean, the actual central threat from Loki gets lost a little bit until you're suddenly in a final battle. So a little bit clunky in our storytelling here. Fantastic casting though. Gotta keep in mind, Hiddleston, Hemsworth, these were not big names when they were cast and they were awesome. They were perfect. I like it. I know, that's great, right? Another. Kicking off our top 30, Black Widow. And I actually think there's a lot to enjoy in this film. I like that we're getting another spy movie in the MCU. I enjoy the spy family dynamic and Florence Pugh and David Harbour are really fun new characters and additions to the MCU. This, this thing that you do when you whip your hair when you're fighting. It's a, yeah. <laughs> It's a fighting pose. You're a total poser. You're not a poser. <laughs> but this is a movie that's a victim of two different creative committees. Back in the day, the Marvel Creative Committee, the guys in New York, refused to greenlight any female-led projects because they didn't think they would sell enough toys. So instead of this movie coming out back at the beginning of Phase 3 where it belonged, it came out awkwardly after the lead character had died at the beginning of Phase 4. Four. Then, when the movie was finally made, it was a victim of the modern MCU parliament, where one of the early directors they were courting to direct the project was overtly told, hey, we'll handle the VFX, we'll handle the action, you just do the dramatic scenes. So she ended up leaving the project because she wouldn't be directing the full film. And then, more recently, David Harbour has said in interviews, yeah, they, uh, they totally reworked the third act. Like Black Widow. The entire third act was reworked as we were shooting, and which is incredible. And so they just want that freedom. They did, not the director. They just like the freedom to change things up. Thus, a bunch of the visual effects in the third act look rushed. They look incomplete and cheap, and it plays like a video game sequence. There's a lot of things in this movie I really do enjoy but it's not nearly as good as it could have been. 29, Miss Marvel. This is a confusing one because half the season was a real pleasant surprise with this youthful, energetic style and this infectious charm coming from Iman Vellani as Miss Marvel. And then the other half of the season seemed like it goes in a totally different direction both on a narrative level as well as stylistically, as if there were two different writing teams and two different directing teams doing episodes one, two, and six versus three, four, and five. Episodes one and six were directed by Adil and Balil. Those are the guys that directed Bad Boys for Life and thus the ones they directed have this energy to it. There's visual onomatopoeia giving it this youthful vibe, but then episodes three, four, and five shift the focus away from damage control 
to these clandestines, and then suddenly we travel the globe all the way to Pakistan. And episodes four and five were directed by Sharmin Obaid Chinoy, who, according to Wikipedia, is a Pakistani Canadian journalist, filmmaker, and activist known for her work in films that highlight gender inequality against women. Most of her filmography is documentaries. I'm not familiar with her work, but you get into episode five and it starts off with a 20 minute flashback to 1940s India showing the effects of the partition of India on one particular family. Going from a teenage girl in Jersey imagining her classmates with devil horns to 1940s adult drama about serious real life events in Pakistan, that's a bit of a pivot. And I think it makes the season very unusual. When it's about her trying to balance family, friends, school with being a teenage superhero in Jersey City, I think it really works. But all that other stuff might have made for a great season two, but it just feels rushed and out of place in the middle of this season. 28, Doctor Strange. This to me is the MCU movie with the most creative visuals and maybe the most formulaic script, or at least the movie where you feel the formula the most. Because with Doctor Strange, you have this fascinating, compelling character that gets pulled into this crazy world of sorcery, and it feels like we're mashing that into this very specific template for what an MCU film is supposed to be. It's enjoyable, it works, but for as wild and creative as the visuals are, the story is very by the numbers. Now, as for those visuals, there are so many cool things in here that we've seen something like it on a smaller scale. There's images that are like Dark City, like Inception, like Escher drawings, but all of it meshed together into sorcery action sequences, which is really, really cool to see. 27, what if season one, and inherent to the nature of this series, it's episodic and it isn't consequential to the main MCU timeline. And that's kind of why I enjoy it. They're just these little thought experiments, these little what if scenarios where you change one ingredient and play it out. And what I enjoyed about them is normally there'd be a second thing because we did this, then this also happened. Likewise, thoroughly enjoyed that they built out this whole mythology, did their own Guardians of the Multiverse team up in the last two episodes. So I really enjoy what they did here. And in particular with the Doctor Strange stuff, they gave us some of the most gut-wrenching MCU that we've ever gotten. Next up, Iron Man 3. And along with Incredible Hulk, I find this to be one of the most underrated MCU films. In fact, as a subversive Shane Black action movie, I think it's really good. But as an MCU film, it is a bit of a misstep. A lot of people judge this movie purely based off a twist that they don't like, which I get and agree with the fact that you don't like it, but I think they miss the movie's actual merits. Shane Black combines really nicely with Robert Downey Jr. line delivery. There's the dynamic with the kid in the movie that I think is great. The action sequences are exciting and memorable. And we're taking Iron Man back to kind of the basics where he just has to use his wits to outsmart the bad guys. But of course you do have a twist where I think they traded in a more compelling, threatening villain for something more generic. So I made a decision and it was wrong. It was a bad call, Ripley. And a villain template about the person scorned that comes back years later that I never particularly find that compelling. 25, Werewolf by Night. And as this one-off little odd adventure, I think that this is a lot of fun. It probably helps that I was at the world premiere of Werewolf by Night. It was a secret screening at Fantastic Fest last year, and they're like, surprise, you're the first audience ever to see Werewolf by Night. And so I even got to see it in a theater. But without the weight of the rest of the MCU, it's allowed to be a little bit weirder, more self-contained, have its own mythology. 
and I dug what they were going for. It's not massively consequential. It's not the biggest scope and size, most thrilling, funniest, or anything like that. It's just a solid standalone story. 24, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Now, I enjoyed this movie more than most people entirely on the basis of the fact that I'm a big Sam Raimi fan. In fact, got my picture taken with him earlier this year. Groovy. And so just seeing some quirky Raimiisms, monsters, eyes popping out, that gave me great enjoyment. And there was enough other stuff in here that it worked for me. But objectively speaking, this is a movie that should have been so much better than it actually was. And so much of it comes down to the compounding effect of the too much oversight and tinkering from the MCU parliament combined with all of the obstacles put in place because of COVID. Earlier this year, America Chavez actress said that they asked for 33 rewrites. And anytime they say they, they're not referring to the director, they're talking about the Marvel Studios Parliament. And Elizabeth Olsen went on to say all sorts of wild stuff about this movie. Then Doctor Strange, like we know those films often are fluid and mm -hmm. it seems like this one was a bit fluid. Like So fluid. I, 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 there's a point in making the movie where I just stopped reading drafts. <laughs> I was, like, I was like, this is just gonna change again. Then Haley Atwell went on to describe how they filmed the Illuminati sequences, and it was the most unnatural method you can imagine where most of the people weren't there. Was everybody there when you shot your stuff? No, um, John, uh, John Krasinski wasn't there. <laughs> Patrick Stewart wasn't there. Um, so it was weird. <laughs> She didn't even know which characters were going to be in the final movie. So did you even know which characters were going to end up in that finished scene? Like, I didn't. I think that they were, you know, we did lots of different things, lots right. of different takes. And then they kind of, the way that they edited it, it was like, oh, suddenly just out of, just very quick. And thought Daniel Craig was going to be in the sequence with her. And then she described it as, yeah, they'll just, you know, use CGI to sort it all out. Just CGI is going to sort everything yes. out. And it did my, I did my voiceover work to make everything that I'd already done on sense. camera make sense. <laughs> That's how we did Doctor Strange. It was a, that one was a wild ride. I, I really did. And when you make a movie that way, people can feel it. I did enjoy the film. I did like it, but I get why you didn't. Dad. Yeah. I just saw Spider-Man. You just saw Spider-Man? That's no. unlikely. No, I will have saw it. Wait, you saw Spider-Man? No. Come on. Gotta go. She saw Across the Spider-Verse on Netflix and wanted to show me. 23, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Now this movie was the follow-up to Infinity War and that's a tall order for two small heroes. <laughs> Ask ChatGTP to write me some Ant-Man puns. That's one of the gems it gave me. I know a lot of people think it's too inconsequential, but I like that it's this simple, lighthearted MacGuffin story. It's a rare example of a street level story in the MCU. The stakes are ant size. The set pieces are less exuberant, but that's what I like about it. And besides the post credit scene, it doesn't have the weight on the of the MCU on its shoulders. It's just a fun little adventure with our heroes. And I like it. Point of reference, everything else on this list, I really enjoy and thinks has something to offer that's special. 22 and 21, Loki season one and two. I don't really know which season I prefer and they really do feel like part one and two, they go together really well. So. I'm combining them here on this list. And I was someone that was very vocally opposed to this TV show because we'd already had a great death for Loki. In fact, he'd had multiple deaths by the time they announced this show. But the show itself won me over with having such a distinct, unique style, fun characters, interesting banter that can be witty, or it can be deep and philosophical. It's often poignant. And it actually builds to do two different finales that crescendo and have emotion to them that actually works. Season two of Loki is a very rare example where there were no 
reshoots for this show. This is maybe the only show or movie in the history of Marvel that had zero additional photography. What they wrote, they stuck to in production and post-production. They had a plan and they were allowed to play it out. And I think you feel that. There was just a clear vision, clearer idea. And so even the set design, the production, the visual effects, everything is sharper. Everything's a little bit better for that reason. 20, Avengers Age of Ultron. This is always a tricky one for me to place on this list because I think the highs are just as high as the first film, which means they're really high but the lows are much lower. This movie, I feel, is a bit of a victim of the ever-expanding franchise and its many demands. With the first Avengers, all they were trying to do was tell a good story that brought together all these characters. But with this movie, there was this much bigger checklist of demands where you had to bring everybody together again, you had to add new Avengers, you're telling a more complicated story, you're setting up Civil War as well as Ragnarok, all while Joss Whedon wanted to keep the runtime the exact same. And I think because of that, you get what I feel is the most confusing movie in the MCU because it's just rushing through so many plot points, but there's so many fantastic scenes in here. Awesome action sequences, great banter, memorable sequences that set up incredible moments in Endgame. So it's very good and also very flawed. Next up, WandaVision, one of the weirdest and most out there MCU projects manages to anchor itself in reality by being this very poignant exploration of love and grief. But what is grief if not love? persevering. On the surface, it's this really fun journey through sitcoms throughout the decades, but it also has this Twilight Zone feel to it, and then certain sequences have an X-Files vibe to it, it shows us the world after the blip, it does a whole lot, and it actually feels cohesive. I can't feel you. It does fail to pay off a few things that it teases, so it feels a little bit disappointing in the end. You're Ralph Boner? Boner. And I thought my jokes were bad. But the journey overall is really good. 18, Ant-Man. Over the years, several of us were growing antsy, waiting for an Edgar Wright-directed Ant-Man film. His idea for the project actually predates the MCU, and he was attached for like 10 years. This is another case of the creative committee in New York being antagonistic towards a director. They didn't view Edgar Wright's contributions as important, and things got so unpleasant that Edgar Wright left. Edgar Anted, I still enjoy the movie that they released. It's this nice, small-scale heist movie. I appreciate that about these films and what I think was missing from Quantumania. Likewise, love Paul Rudd's antics. Though, it does make one wonder what could have been. Ants. Ants. Ant -Man. Next up, Hawkeye, and I really enjoy this show. I want more of the Disney Plus shows to feel like this, which is to say, it's street level. Instead of trying to compete with blockbusters with these massive stories, it's about the guy with his bow and arrow and the person he's training fighting street crimes. Hawkeye finally gets to be front and center. We do a character study. There's a passing of the torch element. I dug all of that. I think Kate Bishop is great. Haley is fantastic playing her. I want to see more of that character. Can I tell you a secret? Please don't do this. Mm. I was talking to an Avenger. And it didn't undermine Clint in order to prop her up. Just a passing of the cho torch as it should be. I get they mishandled Kingpin and they tried to use it as this surprise reveal, which is a gimmick, rather than just announcing he's gonna be in it and allowing him to be a part of the story from beginning to end. And so it felt rushed, underwhelming, and an unsatisfying conclusion. Fair enough. Besides that, I really dug this show. Black Panther Wakanda Forever. 
And to me, this is easily the MCU film that was dealt the worst hand for the obvious reason that Chadwick Boseman, the star of the franchise, died and the movie was being made during COVID. And despite all those circumstances, I think they were able to pull off a coherent story that carried a tremendous amount of emotional weight because of the way they decided to incorporate the real life tragic events into the events of the story. But that also makes the movie feel like we're attending a memorial service as we watch the film. And even as you're watching the movie, there's two different funerals in the film that makes it a heavier MCU film. It still has the quips here and there, still has action sequences, people in enhanced suits and all that stuff, but it carries a much more serious tone. And that's something that I appreciate where far too many MCU films have been too silly as of recently. It's not the easiest watch and, um, I'm still curious how it will stand the test of time when we see where all of this plays out. But I think they were very successful at pulling it together and being a satisfying tribute. 15, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. I love a lot about this film. If you don't know my history as a film critic, way back in the 90s, I had a Jackie Chan fan web page. I was huge into Hong Kong cinema. So I love how this movie pays tribute to Jackie Chan style, as well as the wire fu and Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It incorporates all these different elements. I think you have one of the more compelling villains in this film. And then it's kind of held back by the MCUisms. And what I mean by that is that with the MCU, it feels like they have to make these $200 million big blockbusters. And by doing that, I think they pulled this movie back from greatness to being a little bit more generic. So like the bus fight at the beginning, it's awesome. And then it turns into CGI. Despite Simu Liu doing a bunch of his own action and stunts in there, then they start doing CGI stuff and it's not as interesting. And then they have a big fight with martial arts and then it's like on green screen and CGI again. And we're driving through a CGI maze and CGI dragons show up. They had something unique that would have made it stand out in the MCU. Practical action, grounded action, stunt work, and they still went CGI. And I think that hurt the movie and pulled it back. We were on the verge of greatness. We were this close. But I still really enjoy this film. There's a lot in here to love. Next up, Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special. I adore this little Christmas adventure with my favorite misfits in the MCU. In particular, Drax and Mantis are just delightful as they head into Hollywood and have no idea what they're doing. We're looking for the legendary Kevin Bacon. We're looking for the legendary Kevin Bacon. And kidnap a human in the process. <laughs> You're coming with us. That's a Christmas present. And it is so funny. It's so heartfelt. It has musical numbers in it. It even has a little bit of like expanding the lore of our guardians all in like 42 minutes. And even what they did with Drax and Mantis here made me enjoy Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 more because it evens out their relationship and causes you to interpret it a little bit differently. So something special he will never forget. What about someone special? It, it's not the most complex MCU thing, but it's one that I love. And my family's already watched it like five times and it came out less than a year ago. 13, Captain America, the first Avenger. Rewatching this one a month ago, the first thing that just stood out is how it has its own distinct aesthetic to it. It looks different. The way technology is handled, the lenses being used, it actually has a style and more and more as we move into phase three, four, five, some of that's been ironed out. Individual directors don't get as much freedom to kind of put their own shape and feel on things. And they, like Kevin Feigley intentionally hired Joe Johnston because he liked the work that he did on The Rocketeer, which was a period piece film set around World War II. 
And they brought that into this film, so it has its own unique place in the MCU. Likewise, it has a classic sense of heroism. It has unashamed patriotism. Uh, Steve Rogers is an actual noble person that is motivated by doing the right thing. And there's something refreshing about allowing someone to just be a good person and want to do the right thing. And one of the best scores in the entire MCU. 12, Thor Ragnarok, a movie which pushes the boundaries for how far an MCU film can go without crossing the line, and in doing so, revitalized one of the most lackluster franchises in the MCU. From the color palette, to the score, to the pacing, to the humor, all of it is just bursting with energy. Yeah! but it still manages to have heartfelt, dramatic moments. Our villain is an actual threat. There's The movie has actual consequences in regards to Ragnarok happening with Asgard. Now, I think Waititi's irreverence at times, he doesn't know when to stop. And there's a few scenes where you see that in this movie, in particular, the treatment of the Warriors 3. And a couple times he undercuts the drama with a joke. Because that's what heroes do. But otherwise, this is a great addition. 11, Black Panther, an MCU film that's sort of Shakespearean with its plot. It's often profound with its messaging, but it's still entertaining. It's an example of what you can do with an MCU film if you pour a lot of heart into it and craft a proper narrative. A lot of that comes down to having a villain who's absolutely a villain that needs to be stopped, that is doing evil things, and he is set to do even worse things. But there's some truth in his criticism of Wakanda that has implications that actually explore ideas worth exploring, all in a movie where you also have war rhinos and sneaker puns going on. We've made it to the top 10 with Spider-Man Homecoming, and somehow they managed to make the third Peter Parker in 15 years and the 16th MCU movie in less than 10 years fresh, new, and interesting. And a big part of that is they wisely leaned into the idea that Peter Parker is a high school superhero, and thus you can make a high school movie that also delivers all the big action that you want from an MCU film. Tom Holland is absolutely perfect as this naive high school superhero. Hey Karen, what else can this suit do? <gasps> what? The side characters are likable. The villain feels more grounded, where he's a guy that's turned to crime to provide for his family because he feels wronged by the system. It's not about big sky beams. He's just a guy stealing stuff. And then we found a new way to use Tony Stark and see him in a new way as this very flawed mentor, but someone that is trying to do the right thing. And when you put all those pieces together, you have this interesting new piece in the MCU. You're that spider guy on YouTube, right? Call me Spider-Man. Okay, Spider-Man. Next up, Captain America, the Winter Soldier. This one is elevated by the commitment to keep things as grounded as possible. Possible. During the production, the Russos wanted as many practical sets as they could build. They wanted to do actual stunt work, extensive fight choreography, and because of that, it feels much more visceral and real. The elevator fight scene is still regarded as one of the best fights in the entire franchise. The other thing this movie did right is understanding that Captain America is a black and white character with a strong moral compass, so you drop him in the middle of a gray world where right and wrong isn't cut and dry. You take a character that grew up in an era where you were loyal to institutions and put him in a context where you can't trust those same institutions. And all of a sudden, our very simple character 
is put into a complex world and that is interesting. It's a different type of conflict for our hero to face and that's what makes this movie different, interesting, and special. Number eight, Spider-Man No Way Home. Now, I don't think this is a particularly great film, but it is a fantastic Spider-Man experience. Brilliant, but lazy. You have to keep in mind that Two years before this movie came out, Marvel Studios and Sony broke up and only Tom Holland was able to pull them back together. And then they had to do massive reshoots because Doctor Strange 2 was supposed to come out first and then they moved it back. So this movie had to change its plot around. And then even as they were shooting the finale, they still didn't have a fully complete script and Tom Holland took issue with some of the decisions that they were moving towards. And I think you kind of see that in the final movie of the basic setup. I don't think is particularly compelling. There's in the middle of it, it's unclear exactly what they're trying to do and how this would resolve even some of the problems. And then in the third act, the final resolution, what exactly happens with this final spell that they cast? I don't know, but none of that matters because they knew exactly what did matter and what their audiences wanted. And they delivered that in such a satisfying way. So all of the weird writing stuff, that's not what you feel when you watch the movie. You just have a big grin on your face because it's such a celebration of Spider-Man. And it makes you love movies that you never loved before because it reminds you of something. It's nostalgia done right. If you were there the first couple of days, it was so crazy in there. Like literally like everyone was standing up and screaming. I know my voice is gone. I was clapping, screaming. There's a bunch of parts where people are like, where like, wow. It was nuts. People are going crazy because they delivered an experience worth going to go see opening night with a crowded theater. Then we have Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 7, and I would say that this is easily the best MCU film since Endgame, and it feels like phase three of the MCU. Probably because the script was written five years before the movie came out. Of course, James Gunn was fired. Oh no then hired by DC and then rehired by Disney. And thus he had to sit on his script that he'd already completed before being fired for many, many years. And because of that, I think it doesn't have some of the issues that we've seen in phase four and five, phase five movies where there's a little bit too much tinkering from other people. Maybe it's just that Feige trusted him a little bit more. Maybe it's simply because the movie's designed to close out the Guardian's journey and it's kind of off in its own space that they kind of let him do his own thing. Analogy. Is it? Metaphor. You get a movie that's gut-wrenching especially as you go into Rocket's backstory and make him so much more compelling than he's ever been before. And he was already pretty compelling. It's heartfelt and sincere. You realize just how much these characters love and care about one another. And they find a way to have a satisfying conclusion that feels right and earned without needing to kill anybody off too. So that was a nice little touch. So James Gunn, I just think did a fantastic job. He loves these characters and you feel that when you watch the movie. Six, The Avengers. Now it's easy to forget how big of a deal it was when this movie first came out. There'd never been a team up movie on this scale before where you took all of these very different superheroes a god on Asgard, a World War II soldier, someone like Tony Stark, and blend them all together and find a cohesive tone that fits all of them. And they pulled it off. It's not as evolved and sophisticated as the later Avengers films or even some of the later team-up movies, but... They did what matters most. They told a simple story that provided plenty of opportunities for banter and action set pieces. I care how you speak, and he's my brother. He killed 80 people in two days. 
He's adopted. They got the tone, the characters, and the payoff right, and they laid the foundation for everything bigger that was coming. Fifth place, Captain America Civil War, the better Avengers 2, while still being very much a Captain America-centric story, where Age of Ultron seemed to crack a little bit under the weight of an ever-expanding MCU and a larger set of characters, Civil War thrived under those same conditions by seamlessly following up multiple past projects and setting up all of Phase 3, including Infinity War and Thanos' victory, all while still keeping Steve Rogers and his relationship as Bucky central to that plot line. And it successfully felt like a legitimate conflict inside the team where you understood where Steve Rogers was coming from, and you understood where Tony was coming from, and the comment section still is battling as to which one of them was right. And you get the big fun spectacle at the airport, but you also get the personal battle between two friends, and it's all so good. Real quick before I give you my top four, remember to join me down below in the comments section. Share your ranking of all 45 entries in the MCU. My list is not the right list, it's just my list, and I would love to see yours. Also, I've done one zillion MCU rankings, heroes, villains, final battles, directors, and so much more. You can check them out in that playlist right over there. Fourth, Guardians of the Galaxy, perhaps the ultimate example of the magic of the MCU during its prime, because the Guardians of the Galaxy were D-list characters before this movie came out. James Gunn had only directed small little films that didn't do very well, and they decided to cast the side character on a sitcom as their leading man for this $200 million film. What a bunch of a-holes. Sure, they had a couple A-listers voicing a tree and a raccoon, but... This was not a project of stars. And it was so good that it converted the director, the characters, and the performers into stars instantly because it was so good, so funny, so fresh, so heartfelt, had an amazing soundtrack. Everything delivered and elevated D-listers to A-listers. Said it yourself, bitch. We're the guardians of the galaxy. That was the power of the MCU when they found the right project and they did it right. They built up new stars, and I'm still waiting for them to do that in phases four and five. In third place, Iron Man. The first film is still one of the best. It's not as sophisticated and complicated as later films, and that's exactly why it works. Without having a thousand boxes it needs to check, it can just focus in on telling a story about a broken man trying to be a better man. And in in the process, it lays the foundation for the incredible arc that is Tony Stark in the MCU. I shouldn't be alive unless it was for a reason. You're not the guy to make the sacrifice play. I am Iron Man. They wanted to make a movie that was fun and could poke fun at itself, but also which took the material seriously. Oh, and that tone that you and Robert discovered on that movie, I would say became the template in a way. But that tone of a little bit of a fun, a little bit of a subversiveness, but then also a heart and an earnestness too. Now this is a film where infamously they did not have a completed script when they were shooting the film. And on most projects, that's a really bad thing. But this was early enough in the MCU that that allowed them to pivot and figure out the movie that they were trying to make. It allowed... Robert Downey Jr. have the freedom to really shine and use his personality, infuse it into the character and build the movie around him. And they could do that because they didn't have the responsibility of following up seven movies and setting up the next eight movies. Everyone was on the same page with this movie that was very fluid, just trying to make a great film that people would love. And that's what they pulled 
off. Tied for number one, Avengers Endgame. Historically, I had a couple criticisms with this film when it first came out. Here I am. And now, looking back on it, I just remember the good stuff. We're closing in on almost five years since this movie came out, and I'm only more impressed that they were able to pull this off the more time passes. The first half of the film is an interesting exploration of how all of our Avengers deal with failure and tragedy. And then of course, as you move into the third act, it's just the most satisfying, final battle with all of these great little moments that just had my audience up cheering. They still work watching it at home all these years later, put the big grin on my face and set the high bar for how do you pay off years of storytelling, years of character arcs in such a satisfying way. Now, when I compare this one to Infinity War, I think Infinity War is more, more consistently, solidly awesome. I feel like this one has higher highs, but also lower lows. So I'm tying them for number one. Also in number one, Avengers Infinity War, the ultimate comic book movie experience where they took all my favorite heroes and put them in one movie. Much like the original Avengers, they picked a very straightforward, simple story. It's a MacGuffin movie about tracking down the Infinity Stones, and that provided plenty of opportunity to put different characters from different franchises together, and it was so fun and satisfying. I'm Peter, by the way. Doctor Strange. Oh, you're using your made-up names. Um, I'm Spider-Man then. As well as provided all kinds of opportunities for massive battles, which were just cool to see on the big screen, just all of my toys playing together in one movie. But the other nice trick that they pulled with this film is that we couldn't give all of our heroes a character arc. So they did the character work with the villain and we spend time with him and learn about him and what drives him. And it makes for such a compelling villain, but also does add character work into a movie with a lot of characters that you can't spend a lot of time with and it had the balls to let the villain win in the end. So for me, this is everything that I want from a comic book movie. He's the best. I love it. It's funny, it's exciting, it has emotional stakes, it just has stakes in general. So it comes in at number one. If you enjoyed this video, remember I've done a ton of other Marvel rankings. You can check out all that stuff over there. Heroes, villains, final battles, directors. Also, I've done spoiler reviews for all of the movies in the MCU, I think, except for Shang-Chi. You can check those out right over there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.